Well, my name is Audrey Mossberger, and I'm director of events at the National Bureau of Asian Research. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event on China's ambitions and security implications of the Belt and Road, hosted in partnership with the Bush School DC. Following remarks by our expert panel, we will open it up to a moderated Q&A. For those joining us here on WebEx and via live stream, we um, encourage you to email your questions to events at nbr.org. Uh, please feel free to send these questions in prior to Q&A, as you might find that your question is addressed throughout the course of the discussion. If not, our moderator will do her best to present all questions to our panel within our allotted time. Um, I will now turn it over to Lieutenant General J. J.B. Silveria, the Executive Director of Texas A&M's University, uh, Texas A&M University's Bush School of Government and Public Service in Washington, D.C., for brief introductory remarks, and then we will turn it over to our panel. Prior to joining the Bush School in 2020, General Silveria served as Superintendent of the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. There, he directed a four-year regimen of military training and academic, athletic, and character development programs that led students to a Bachelor of Science degree and a commission as a second lieutenant. General Silver Silveria also had a distinguished career in the Air Force. He served as Deputy Commander, Combined Air Force Air Component, U.S. Central Command, Southwest Asia. In that role, he was responsible for the command and control of air operations in a 20-nation area of responsibility, covering Central and Southwest Asia. Key military operations, resolute support in Afghanistan, and inherent resolve in Iraq and Syria took place under his command. He was awarded a Distinguished Service Medal and Bronze Star, along with multiple Air Medals during his career. General Silveria is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy with a Bachelor of Science degree. He also earned a Master of Social Science degree from Syracuse, New York. General Silveria, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Audrey, and uh, good morning. We're excited to co-sponsor this event with the National Bureau of Asian Research. The Bush School of Texas A&M University is new to Washington, D.C. At the same time, though, the Bush School has a long-standing tradition of sending graduates to work in Washington and abroad, in line with our ethos that public service is a noble calling. Our students and faculty look forward to being part of so many impactful discussions in Washington, advancing thought in a number of areas, including today's topic of China and the Belt and Road. We have some outstanding faculty and a wealth of knowledge on China, Russia, and the greater Asia region. Thank you to NBR for moderating today's discussion, and thank you for partnering up with us on this event. Thank you, and we look forward to a great discussion. Thanks so much, General Severia. Hi, everybody. My name is Ali Solinsky. I'm the Vice President of Research at the National Bureau of Asian Research. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be moderating this panel uh, here with you today and for NBR to be partnering with the Bush School DC. We really look forward to a time, hopefully, in the not too distant future where we're able to cooperate and partner with uh, the Bush School DC on in person activities as well. But I think that the discussion here virtually today is sure to be really engaging and uh, and hopefully our audience uh, really enjoys it. So at MBR, we've long been studying and publishing research on the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as examining. China's ambitions and strategy for its near region and for the globe, including an initiative we just completed last year on China's vision for a new world order. So we're very much looking forward to this discussion today that will combine some of these themes together, examining how Central Asia fits into China's vision for a new world order, assessing China's growing influence in the region through the Belt and Road Initiative, and exploring how China seeks to secure its expanding interests. Before I uh, introduce our distinguished speakers, I just wanted to once again thank the Bush School DC for partnering with us and uh, our NBR and Bush School DC colleagues for uh, putting this event together and organizing it. A lot of work went into it behind the scenes and we really appreciate their efforts. So we're going to hear from three speakers today um, and we'll go in the order that I introduce them here. First up will be Nadej Rolon, who is a senior fellow for political and security affairs at the National Bureau of Asian Research. 
Her research focuses mainly on China's domestic foreign and defense policy, grand strategy, and the changes in global dynamics resulting from the rise of China. Nadezh has written and edited several books, including the book China's Eurasian Century, Political and Strategic Implications of the Belt and Road Initiative, and the recent report, China's Vision for a New World Order. So we'll hear from Nadezh first, kind of set the scene on uh, China's uh, vision and strategy for, for the region. And then we'll turn to Dr. Zoe Liu, who is an instructional assistant at uh, assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service in DC. Dr. Leo also holds research positions at the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, Sovereign Net at the Institute of Business in the Global Context at the Fletcher School, and the Edwin Reichshauer Center for East Asian Studies. Her interests include international political economy, comparative politics, and international finance with area expertise in East Asia. And finally, to round us out, we'll hear from Dr. Ed Lennon, who is a research assistant professor at the Bush School. He was previously an assistant professor at the Daniel Morgan Graduate School, a global fellow at the Wilson Center, and a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University. Dr. Lemon's research focuses on the transnational dimensions of authoritarianism, including transnational repression and authoritarian regional organizations, with a focus on post-Soviet Central Asia, Russia, and China. So with that, we will turn and dive into our discussion and presentations, uh, starting with Nadej. Thank you, Ali. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining joining us today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to uh, see everyone, um, albeit uh, virtually. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly, um, setting the strategic stage, if I may explain it this way about strategic, um, Chinese uh, strategic vision for the Central Asian region. And uh, it seems to me like uh, Beijing's vision is really evolving. Um, it's not just considering the Central Asian countries as important neighbors um, uh, connected by rivers and mountains, uh, as the, the Chinese saying uh, explains. Uh, not only as sources uh, for energy supply, and not only as transit routes for uh, their exports towards Europe, um, not only as partners in the fight against the so-called three evils, the terrorism, extremi extremism, and separatism, but more and more, I think, in the context of a, an accelerated competition against uh, the West and the US in particular. Um, I think there's a before and after BRI, uh, but there's also a before and after 2017, 2018. This is an important date, both because of the 19th Party Congress in Beijing that set out a new uh, era, a new path for China with a more global vision, um, but also a, an era of, of great power competition at, as explained and set in the national security strategy for the US. So there are three points I'll, I'll, I'll make. The first is uh, about the Belt and Road, and I think Dr. Liu will talk more about that, so I'll be very brief on that. Um, you know, China is now, of course, a major economic and trade partner for Central Asian countries, a major um, investor also for, for them. Um, and Beijing believes that BRI has, uh, is, is highly compatible with uh, Central Asian needs. Um, there's a lot of effort uh, for what they call docking, which is aligning Belt and Road with local development um, programs. Um, there's a set of projects that have um, set, um, uh, that have begun, that have been put in place. Um, but there's also a, a whole array of activities that are more meant to connect the hearts and minds of, of uh, the region. If I may explain it this way, it's about expanding influence uh, through the connection of um, uh, several training programs that I will talk about later. Um, the other side of this very successful coin is also a growing worry about uh, Chinese activities from regional countries uh, that Beijing feels um, 
uh, is unavoidable. It's just natural that as China's presence uh, is growing in the region, then regional countries will start to see uh, Beijing with a, a worried eye, but there's nothing unnatural about that. The second point I want to make is that from Beijing's perspective, the region is undergoing a lot of changes um, that are not all negative. Um, and especially uh, they have been, um, the, the, the Chinese elites have been observing the power transfers in Uzbekistan and in Kazakhstan um, with some uh, great satisfaction because they feel like these power transitions have happened without um, so-called external hostile forces meddling with the local uh, process and um, having been able to um, pr effectively protect themselves against what they call color revolutions, like the ones that have happened in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. That's their own reading about that. So this ability to maintain domestic political stability uh, in a time of change, uh, both in, in 2016 um, for, um, for Uzbekistan and more recently uh, 2019 for Kazakhstan. This has been viewed as a, as a positive um, development for the region. Beijing is now obviously worried about the lingering effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the regional economies uh, and um, is trying to uh, develop cooperations on that also with local countries. It's still very worried also of um, the expansion of religious extremism and specifically on the diffusion of extremist ideas uh, on the Internet. And so as this is a worry, it's also perhaps for Beijing an opportunity to uh, try to develop cooperations in the cyberspace also with local countries. And that's I think is a space to watch. Uh, third and, and final point, um, Beijing sees that um, there are great changes happening also in the U.S. strategy, not only towards Central Asia, but also towards China. And I think this is really important in understanding how Beijing sees the Central, reg Central Asian region, not only for itself, but also in the context of this broader geopolitical and geostrategic competition against the US. Um, Beijing feels that the US have uh, shifted from um, a, a sort of containment of Russia in the region uh, after the end of the Cold War towards a dual containment of both Russia and China in Central Asia, but China being its primary target. Uh, they see uh, the US as trying to uh, prevent or thwart the BRI development. Um, they see them as hyping the Xinjiang issue, as attempting to isolate um, China by strengthening um, multi um, multilateral cooperation that excludes China. That's uh, the launch of the C5 plus one format in 2015 is seen as, as such. And identifying China as part of uh, malign forces or malign actors together with Russia and Iran in their newest uh, strategy published in uh, February 2020 for uh, Central Asia. So really, uh, from Beijing perspective, uh, the great power competition is on globally, but it's really on also specifically in, in Central Asia. And the US is trying to do everything they can to restrain China uh, in the region. On the other hand, though, it seems like they feel um, uh, like rather optimistic about their own prospects in Central Asia. Their economic appeal is still very important. They feel like BRI is highly suitable for uh, Central Asia. There are not fundamental political divergences or differences or even frictions. And their solid partnership with Russia is also a very important asset uh, for them to continue to spread their influence in the region. Um, the consolidation of the Chinese influence or, and cooperation 
um, has been established also to, through a new format, which is sort of copied on on the uh, the American um, um, C5 plus one. It's called C plus C5, China plus the five Central Asian countries uh, that has been created in July last year and has just uh, um, finished or uh, closed their second summit last May, uh, where um, there's a, a, a new roadmap for the development of corporations in the region. Um, very interesting um, list of corporations that they want to pursue, um, including uh, Afghanistan. Um, so I will stop here because I think um, that my colleagues will look into both the uh, BRI and the security side in more detail. And I'm looking forward to the conversation and discussion after that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nadej. All right, over to you, Dr. Liu. It's a great honor to be here and uh, share with you my perspective on China's BRI and uh, China's strategic vision in the context of uh, Central Asia. And uh, before I, I start, I really want to express my appreciation and thanks to our friends at MBR and the colleagues at the Bush School to uh, make this event happen. And um, uh, Ms. Nadej Rowland has just given us an excellent outline of China's strategic vision along the BRI and in the region. And she also highlighted some important initiatives that China has implemented in the region. Uh, and uh, she concluded by talking about the broader global context of US-China strategic competition. And uh, uh, my discussion will zoom in on one dimension of this broader Chinese strategic vision, which is the one element in China's exercising of financial statecraft along the BRI in the Central Asian context. Uh, especially, I wanted to talk about China's push for de-dollarization in the region, as well as its implications. So uh, my discussion will focus um, primarily two aspects. The first is how China has been using the BRI framework to advance uh, the use of local currency in bilateral settlement, especially the renminbi internationalization in Central Asia. And secondly, how China has been pushing for de-dollarization through multilateral institutions, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which four of the five Central Asian countries are members. So the key takeaway from my discussion is that China's not so subtle push for the use of local currencies uh, through the BRI framework suggests that the function of the BRI for China today has already gone beyond its initial scope. You know, in 2013, when uh, President Xi uh, talked about the BRI in Kazakhstan, uh, that was the idea at that time was being interpreted as uh, you know, a, a, a rebranded version of China's going out of strategy or an elevated version of that. And uh, the, the fundamental a driver was to solve the domestic overcapacity and uh, to coordinate industrial uh, cooperation, industrial production cooperation through global market. So, uh, but now things have changed. And I, China's attempt at mobilizing other countries along the BRI to promote the use of local currencies in trade and investment and bilateral settlement is an attempt to reduce the dependence on the US dollar and the dollar denominated global economic and financial system. So in other words, the BRI itself has become a vehicle or a framework through which China is building an alternative non-dollar based global financial system. So for China as well as other countries, especially countries that are often uh, target of the US sanctions, as well as their trading partners, uh, they, this uh, emerging non-dollar based global financial system would provide an alternative way to access global market. So the expansion of this alternative financial system will enable countries uh, to evade U.S. sanctions and therefore uh, weaken an important instrument of U.S. Uh, economic statecraft. Uh, but for China, this would be an important step to exercise its influence in global system, as well as to advance uh, President Xi's strong interest in uh, increasing Chinese influence in global financial governance. 
So let me quickly brief with the, brief with you uh, the two aspects that I wanted to focus on today. So the first one, how China has been using the BRI framework to advance international uh, the use of local currency, especially the use of inter internationalization in the Central Asia context. So uh, there are a couple of mechanisms. The first is the use of local currency in cross-border settlement, especially the use of renminbi. And uh, my latest data was uh, uh, my, my latest data is to uh, 2019. So I found that in 2019, the use of renminbi cross-border settlement along BRI countries exceeded renminbi 2.73 trillion dollars, and uh, that is uh, an increase by 32 percent uh, compared with uh, the number in 2018. So to promote cross-border settlement, an important instrument is the use of bilateral currency swaps. So this brings me to talk about the second mechanism, which is the use of bilateral currency swaps to support the use of renminbi in cross-border settlement. And in the context of Central Asia, China has signed bilateral currency swaps with three of its main trading and partners and outward FBI destinations, including Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan, and, uh, and Tajikistan. And I also wanted to highlight that uh, the bilateral currency swap with Kazakhstan has been renewed three times already. And uh, with regard to uh, Kyrgyzstan, although China right now uh, has not signed a bilateral currency swap with Kyrgyzstan, the PBOC and the National Bank of, the, of Kyrgyzstan uh, have already signed an intent to uh, strengthen sending bilateral cooperation, which is a step towards a currency swap. And the, the third channel for China to push in uh, renminbi internationalization in the region is China's support for Astana Financial Center. I guess it's interesting that a lot of land, uh, inland cities are thinking about building themselves not necessarily as international financial center, but actually a, a, a regional or mid-tier financial center. And Astana is, is, is a good example. And uh, this partnership was actually, uh, people consider Astana Financial Center as China-backed Central Asia Financial Center, and the Shanghai Stock Exchange has, uh, you know, uh, involved, has been involved in this quite closely. And uh, actually, the Chinese state-owned commercial banks have also shown their support in making Astana a renminbi center in the region and promoted the development of an offshore market in Central Asia. So, um, for example, China Construction Bank, one of the largest uh, four state owned commercial banks in China, uh, had issued this so called Falcon bond at the Astana International Exchange and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange as well. So, through this bond, you uh, the Astana International Exchange and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange were able to have a connection. And this is the first yuan bond issued in Central Asia, and this is also an important result of financial cooperation between Kazakhstan and China under uh, the BRI framework. So now I, I, I'd like to um, move on to the second aspect, which is how China mobilizes other countries to push for de-dollarization through multilateral institutions, such as the SCO. So the SCO currently comprises eight members, four observatory states who are uh, interested in uh, gaining full membership, then, and, and there are also uh, six dialogue partners. And of all these different tiers of members, Central Asian countries are included, and there is also India, there is also Russia, there is also Turkey, there is also Iran. So, as we know, the SCO itself was originally was was initially constructed solely for the purpose uh, of security co cooperation in the region. But it has gradually or uh, evolved, uh, becoming uh, incorporating more economic dimensions as well. So before the two, I think the key uh, uh, key, key milestone here is the Shanghai summit in 2006. So before the two, right immediately before the Shanghai summit in 2006, SCO members launched the SCO interbank cooperation mechanism. And then during the Shanghai summit, members also launched SCO business council to facilitate a greater economic cooperation within the SCO framework. And uh, last year in December, 
during the New Delhi SEO Summit, the SEO announced their plans to further enhance financial cooperation, and they also expressed their willingness to continue discussions on the establishment of a SCO Development Bank and the SCO Development Fund. So this meeting sort of also underscored the importance of joint approaches uh, to promote the use of national currencies in uh, mutual settlement uh, between S uh, among SEO members. Here, the reason I wanted to mention this institutions, such as you know, the the the, the possibility of the SEO Development Bank and Development Fund, I wanted to mention this because uh, actually China has long been interested in using the SEO to promote uh, the use of local currency. So, for example, in uh, in in June 2012, Wang Qishan, the Vice Premier of China, he spoke at the SEO Business Council and expressed China's uh, interest in promoting the use of local currency among the SEO members. And 2012, that was you know before the official launch of the BRI. And uh, uh, I also wanted to note that besides the Central Asian countries, there are also other SEO members. Uh, have overlapping membership with the BRICS. So at the institutional level, uh, we've already seen some, we were already seeing some signs of convergence. So for example, both the, the SEO and BRICS have established their respective interbank cooperation mechanism, and uh, the BRICS have already created their new development bank, and now the SEO is considering doing that, moving towards the same direction as well. So. By closer alignment between these different varieties of multilateral institutions, that it does not necessarily include the United States and China, and uh, in, from this aspect, Russia as well, they are very interested in pushing toward de dollarization. And between the cooperation between BRICS and SCO is already happening. So, uh, for example, the Secretary General uh, Vladimir Norov recently confirmed that the SCO members have been working on a great uh, gradual transition to use to uh, towards the use of local currency in bilateral settlement. And uh, uh, the exact agency to implement this is the SCO Interbank Consortium. So, and he also talked about how the SCO wanted to partnership with AIIB, the NDB, the new the, the, the Silk Road Fund to fully unlock uh, the investment potential of the of the SCO. And uh, the SCO Finance Minister meetings last year in Moscow, um, all the eight full members of SCO agreed to send uh, recommendations to finalize a roadmap towards the de-dollarization. So uh, to conclude, you know, by promoting the use of local currencies in bilateral trade, especially the use of renminbi along the BRI, and uh, uh, by mobilizing other countries through regional or multilateral institutions that don't necessarily include the United States, China's ambition with BRI has gone beyond solving the issue of domestic overcapacity, but rather to include uh, the, the, the construction of a non-dollar based uh, global financial infrastructure along the BRI to de-dollarize global, uh, global finance. And uh, again, this corresponds to uh, President Xi's strong interest in increasing China's influence in global financial governance. And uh, as Alison uh, mentioned earlier in her, in her opening remarks, the BRI indeed uh, you know, presents to us a China vision of a global order. And I hope that my discussion today uh, give you this uh, interpret, give, give, give you a broader look into this China vision. And uh, for, for in this particular vision or in China's vision of a global order, an indispensable part is this alternative non-dollar denominated global financial system. And uh, thank you very much. And I look to our discussion later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Leo. Lots to dive into there, and we're already getting a few questions. So just a quick reminder before I turn it over to Dr. Lemon that as our audience members have questions, you're welcome to submit them now. You don't have to wait until all of the remarks have concluded and um, just send them in an email to events at nbr.org. And I'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Lemon. Well, good morning and thank you um, to MBR and the Bush School for hosting today's event. I hope this will be the beginning of a, of a, a cooperative relationship going forward. My remarks that really focus on security cooperation between China and Central Asia, I wanted to make two broad points. First, that over the past decade and certainly over the past five years, there's been a dramatic 
development and rise in the level of security cooperation between China and Central Asia. And China is experimenting with new forms of political and security cooperation that we see being used going forward in other uh, BRI countries. And second, that China is increasingly going it alone. The region's traditional external hegemon, certainly in terms of security provision, um, Russia, China is increasingly um, leaving Russia out of various initiatives and, and it's increasingly developing bilateral cooperation and multilateral cooperation in forum that don't include Russia. So they're the two overarching points I wanted to make. If we cast our minds back just under 20 years ago, the United States had two places in the region in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. The United through NATO it was involved in close security cooperation and organizing exercises with the militaries of the region. But as Nadesh has already mentioned, the United States has slowly exited the region. We saw security cooperation and military assistance to the region fall from its peak of 450 million back in 2012, ahead of the first proposed withdrawal from Afghanistan, down to 2 million in 2019. That's a 98% reduction. By 2014, all of the um, US bases in the region had been shuttered, and we obviously are now seeing the withdrawal of both NATO and US forces from Afghanistan in September. So China, in some ways, is coming into this, this vacuum of, of US exiting. China's security cooperation has, has developed very extensively, and it's no coincidence that when BRI was announced in 2013, OBOR as it was back then, uh, the land component of that the Silk Road Economic Belt, as Nadezh mentioned, was announced in Kazakhstan. And as remarked, Xi Jinping obviously referred to the historic position of Central Asia on, on, on the Silk Road or Silk Roads, and that China was building a Silk Road for the 21st century. China has risen economically, as we've already mentioned, from 2003 having around $3 billion worth of trade to by um, 2018 having $30 billion worth of trade with the region. But as China's presence in the region has risen, so have some of the pushback um, and the security threats to China that have risen the region. And I think they stem from two, from China's perspective, they stem from two major sources. The first is from terrorism, and this comes from two sources within the region. I think first, Central Asia is home to somewhere in the region of 300,000 ethnic Uyghurs, uh, many of whom fled um, China during the civil war into Central Asia uh, for that. And China has long viewed the region as a potential hotbed for separatists from Xinjiang or at least a base for terrorists to move into China. We've seen very little evidence of this actually materializing. We saw um, a number of attacks in the, the late 1990s and the early 2000s, and most recently an, an attack on the uh, Chinese embassy in Bishkek in the capital of Kyrgyzstan um, that only resulted in one person being killed. And the details around the case were very, um, very uh, unclear, although it was based on the blame of, on the Turkestan uh, Islamic Party. Um, Uyghur um, separatist terrorist group. The other terrorist threat that China sees within the region stems from Afghanistan, and we know from some of the leaked documents from the Xinjiang papers that were leaked to the New York Times back in 2019. We know that Xi Jinping um, is very, or was very concerned even back in 2014 about the potential for spillovers from Afghanistan, um, the potential for Afghanistan to also form a hotbed in Central Asia to be a transit point for terrorists um, to attack Xinjiang. Again, we haven't seen that materialize, but these are certainly some of the things that we know China is concerned about. Um, on a more actual level, we've seen quite a lot of pushback against China from the Central Asian populations themselves. We know particularly in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, based on survey data from the Central Asia barometer, that around 30% in um, Kyrgyzstan, around 35% in Kazakhstan, uh, of the population, according to the survey data, have negative opinions of China seen protests materializing across the region against China. As part of a project that I'm involved with collecting data on protests in the region, we've collected data on 106 Chinese anti-China protests in the region since 2018. And that's around 8% of the protests that we found in the region had some sort of China spin on them, mostly to do with wanting to push back against the, the uh, excesses of, of Chinese uh, environmental destruction by mines, for example, or wanting to push back against perceptions that China's coming and colonizing the region and taking land 
but also related to the situation in Xinjiang and the education camps where you know, some uh, obviously ethnic Uyghurs but also ethnic Kazakh and Kurdis find themselves and so a number of the protests related to human rights in China as well. When we saw a revolution and the overthrow of the government in Kyrgyzstan in October 2020, we saw a power vacuum and we saw a number of Chinese mines and other investments being attacked. Um, we saw in one case uh, 100 Chinese workers having to flee to a, a forest nearby um, to spend the night because the local uh, population, certain local population had looted and burnt down the mine. And we saw uh, women being threatened with rape and we saw uh, armed men turning up at an oil refinery in Karabalta in northern Kyrgyzstan, you know, threatening uh, to uh, kill the uh, Chinese workers unless they paid $350,000 for uh, protection money. So we certainly have seen um, China's investments in the region come under threat. So what has China done in response to this? Well, it's increased security cooperation in a number of ways. It's become a larger player in the arms market. Um, which traditionally was the reserve primarily of, of Russia, um, but also a number of other partners. And so we've seen China's percentage of the weapons being exported to Central Asia or imported to Central Asia increase from 1.5% in the first five years of the 2000, to, to, between 2010 and 2014, um, up to 16% uh, in the second half between 2015 and 2020. So we've seen China exporting um, missile defense systems to Turkmenistan. Uzbekistan, for example, um, but also um, smaller uh, armored armor personnel car uh, carriers, uh, guns, and various other forms of surveillance technology to the different countries. So China increasing its arms exports, China also engaging in an increasing number of bilateral exercises um, between the PS, um, the, um, uh, the PLA, um, and the local uh, militaries, border guards, security services and national guards. Increasingly, and this is part of this broad trend, China is moving away from only operating through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Its first, well, its first bilateral exercise in the region in 2002 was organized under the auspices of the SCO. Um, China's now increasingly going beyond the SCO and organizing its own bilateral uh, or multilateral exercises, um, organizing eight exercises since its first with Kyrgyzstan in 2014. China has also established its first overseas military facility in the region. Um, this hasn't been uh, acknowledged by both the Tajik side, and it's located in Tajikistan in the border with Afghanistan, or the Chinese side. Uh, but it, you know, it's been reported in various media outlets and um, you know, appears in, in satellite imagery. So it would be relatively competent. And there is a very small base stationing something in the region of 200 troops near the border between China, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, responding to this perceived threat of spillovers from Afghanistan, but that's obviously one of China's very first overseas military facilities in the world that was thought to have been established around 2016. So we're seeing China playing a greater role in Central Asian security and increasingly being less deferential to Russia, which is my final point. When China sought to establish the base back in 2016, there were reports that there were meetings between Chinese and Russian officials to get Moscow's blessing for the establishment of a base in a region where Russia has also has troops stationed in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and has military facilities in Kazakhstan. But more recently, we're seeing, as Nadezhda and Zoe have already spoken about, we're seeing China increasingly going it alone without reference to Russia. So we saw, as Nadezhda mentioned, the establishment of this new uh, Central Asia plus or CA plus C5 plus C format um, was modeled in many ways on similar ex efforts by um, Japan, by the United States, by Korea. So emulating those mechanisms to bring together the Central Asian foreign ministries with China without uh, the involvement of Russia. We also saw the establishment in 2016 of the quadrilateral coordination and cooperation mechanism between Tajikistan, Pakistan, and Afghanistan that reportedly aims to fight terrorism. So we're seeing China increasingly um, going it alone. At this point, friction between Russia is somewhat minimal. Russia's share in the arms market has remained steady. Russia continues to station troops in the region and continues to be a major um, external security provider for the region. But as China continues to uh, play an increasing role in Central Asian security, we may see this changing come years. That I will stop and turn to the 
Q and A. Thanks so much, Dr. Lemon. All right, so um, we've got some great questions coming in, and I'm going to kick it off with a few uh, questions. Some I'll I'll start out by trying to kind of uh, get our arms around how these three topics and presentations really connect because there were a lot of points of similarity and areas of overlap I think that are really interesting to to bring together so from a kind of broader perspective we've now heard from our three participants today that uh, that there are a few different aspects and motivating factors behind China's development of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Belt and Road projects, particularly in Central Asia. So, beginning with Nadezh, Nadezh's presentation and discussion on some of the broader strategic uh, factors, and in particular, briefly touched on, but perhaps we can dive a little bit further into um, how China uses or is hoping to. Uh, uh, benefit from BRI projects in terms of influence in the region. And then, of course, Zoe's comments touching on some of the objectives that China has in terms of economic development and how um, that has evolved over the past several years. And then uh, Ed rounding us out with some of the uh, motivating factors for China to um, pay attention to and focus on security and uh, really securing uh, its interests along the Belt and Road Initiative. So the the presentations from our speakers today were, you know, pretty complementary in focusing on these different aspects. And as they all have noted, um, some of those uh, factors have shifted as BRI has evolved. So for our speakers, uh, if you could just take a step back and assess, uh, to what extent do you think China is achieving its objectives in these different areas in Central Asia? And uh, you know what? What are the primary challenges it's continuing to face as these objectives evolve in achieving them uh, in, in these three areas? So we'll go, I think, in order again uh, to start with a little bit broader and then focus on the the more narrow aspects. So Nadej, first to you. Thank you. Yes, I I just wanted to go back to. Um... Uh, to BRI itself, you know, uh, we tend to forget that from the start, it was, um, it has five main pillars and not just uh, infrastructure construction, but the first one is policy coordination. So uh, that's what we already see happening uh, in, in the Central Asian context, where each country has their its own development plans and Beijing wants to align them with the BRI's objectives. So that's a very important one. The second is infrastructure construction. Uh, but it's not just hard infrastructure, it's also the soft part of it. It's not just um, highways, it's also digital. Um, the third is a trade, uh, and there's a lot going on also with, with the region. Um, the fourth is financial integration, and Dr. Liu talked very well about this and what aspects are ac actually going on, especially through the currency swap and the financial um, um, side of this regional integration. Um, and the fifth one is people to people exchanges. And I think people don't really pay much attention to this because they think, oh, okay, it's tourism and, um, you know, but there's, there's a whole um, set of activities that are also taking place that are, are underway, that are getting developed. and. And I'm going back to the recent um, C plus C5 summit in Xi'an, where um, there there have been a, a, China has agreed to provide vocational training, educational training, and also political training for elites of the region. So vocational training. Uh, um, basically focused on, it's the Luban workshops, it's uh, um, training engineers, agric agricultural engineers in particular. Um, China is offering scholarships for students to go um, study in China. And there's a, also an annual uh, 100 
person, 100 people training class for officials that are in charge of poverty alleviation in Central Asian countries. So, you know, it's it, these are all the facets of Belt and Road that people probably tend to to forget there. Um, there's uh, an um, COVID-19 assistance, the vaccine, uh, telemedicine cooperation. Um, there are some research centers specifically um, um, on agriculture, archaeology, traditional medicine uh, that are also being put into place. So um, BRI does not evolve. Uh, it stays the same as it should, as it was designed from the beginning. It's just that we see more and more of those activities taking place over time. You know, it's only been seven, soon eight years, um, and it's it's growing in every places where it's supposed to grow. Uh, so we're we're seeing more of these activities taking shape, other than in rhetoric right now. That that would explain uh, what explains why there's some a, a multiplicity of, of activities going on. Great, uh, Zoe. Um, I think I will, you know, follow Nadege over overall um, comment on the on China's uh, aspiration in the region. I guess I, I will again, you know, zoom in on, on, on finance. I'll be, I think uh, here what China really wants is uh, initially, probably is we we, we 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 tend to think that China's interest in the region is more about energy and the natural resources. But but gradually, uh, Chinese in, uh, interests have have have, have shifted to uh, increasing global is influence in the global financial system. And uh, I'll just use one example to illustrate this. Like uh, so, there is this. Um, um, uh, Taiwu uh, Uzbekistan highway project that was delivered by the China Road and Bridge Corporation with like very big contractor pushing through Chinese uh, infrastructure overseas. So the the project was delivered in 2012, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the construction funds is not loaned directly to Uzbekistan, but rather through the the fund came from uh, sorry uh, fr from um, uh, Uzbek from Tajikistan as a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And uh, then uh, later in 2015, PBOC signed a bilateral currency swap with Tajikistan's central bank for $3 billion. So uh, through this example, I wanted to illustrate that China has been able to use uh, multilateral international or regional institutions to engage or mobilize other countries to move towards the goal of uh, reducing its dependence on the dollar and therefore China's vulnerability to U.S. sanctions. And when we talk about Central Asia, probably the one elephant in the room inevitably is and there are a huge future on China-Russia competition uh, for influence in the region. But at least with regard to the issue of de-dollarization, I think China and Russia both have shared interests uh, and both consider Central Asia as an important region. So, well, for example, both China and Russia have constructed their own alternative to SWIFT system, and China and Russia have uh, expressed interest in connecting those two countries' cross-border payment system. So meaning they are able to co uh, connect their uh, cross-border payment transactions so that they don't have to go through the SWIFT in case the US, uh, in case of US sanctions. And this provides an opportunity both for China and Russia, as well as other stakeholders such as Iran, uh, Venezuela, uh, or other countries in the region. So from that perspective, I'll just conclude uh, with saying that it, with re regard to what China wants in the region, um, it looks like as China influence as China, Chinese capital goes abroad, as Chinese infrastructure goes abroad, China's aspiration seems also to uh, increase, and not necessarily only with regard to natural resources or infrastructure, but more importantly, an alternative um, international financial system. Thank you. All right, and. I think in terms of China's greatest security or political challenge in Central Asia, I think, of course, there are various, but I would pick up on points I made around Sinophobia, which is still being very widespread. 
in the region. I think in stark contrast to Russia that is still viewed by many um, as being you know, a benevolent, benevolent partner that works in the interests of the people. It's, it differs from country to country, um, but Russia is still on, on the whole viewed in more positive terms than, than China is. There's still ongoing you know, ideas that China is coming to colonize the region, that China has very nefarious interests and all this talk of, of um, becoming lovable as uh, Xi Jinping mentioned today, or mutually beneficial cooperation is really a smokescreen for, for a, a colonial, colonial project by China. You know, this is very, this viewpoint is very widespread and cuts across various segments segments of society and different political political views from, from the more progressive to the more illiberal. And we're seeing various opposition movements now, particularly in Kazakhstan, picking up on anti-China rhetoric. And a lot of the protests that are more generally around transition in the country after Nazarbayev's resignation and that are calling for reforms are also, you know, having an anti-China um, element to them. So I think, you know, that's obviously important because China, China, these you know, populations, although it's an author, country or region dominated by authoritarian governments, the people still do have a say in we saw in 2016, you know, some of the first largest scale protests in Kazakhstan after independence coming against the reform to land code that was read, that allowed the government to sell land to foreigners that would, you know, was read by the people as being, well, the government will sell land to China and China will, will, will um, increase its influence and, and gradually, gradually uh, buy, buy the country's land. That led to the government scrapping that land code or moving that provision within the land code. We saw a, a logistics center, so $280 million investment um, in a, a transit hub on the border between Kyrgyzstan and China being canceled in February 2020 as a result of local protests. So I think I think activities that Nadesh describe are, you know, are very important because ultimately, you know, winning over the elite and winning over the technocratic classes is key for China's um, ambitions, but at the same time, it's 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 difficult for China to win over win over many of the local population, even though it's been trying with um, you know various forms of corporate social responsibility and investing in local schools and and hiring more locals and, and decreasing the percentage of Chinese nationals working at various investment projects. But it's, been, it's a difficult difficult uh, thing to overcome. And I think the latest data from Central Asia wrong to them we release soon um, that I've seen some of indicates that in fact according to their survey data um, anti-Chinese feeling is, is is increasing in the region not decreasing up now towards more like 50 percent as opposed to um, 30 to 35 percent in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan so uh, yeah that aspect I think is 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 important and something that China's attempting to do but not very successfully thus far and Ed, since you're on this topic and we have a question specifically on it um, that was contributed, um, I'll kind of just continue along this thread briefly. Um, so somebody asked whether you, you feel or you think that there is a level of xenophobia in uh, anti-Chinese feelings in the region, uh, exacerbating the reactions of Central Asian citizens towards China. So specifically, are there are Chinese citizens constructed as a threat at an individual level? Um, and it, is it connected at all with uh, more global anti-China, um, anti-Asian sentiments, especially if this uh, person asks uh, if it's connected to some of the sentiments we've seen in the United States recently, um, whether those are kind of similar themes? Yeah, I think it's it's been there for a long time. Um, for whatever reason, China is viewed as something of an ethnic other um, within the region, um, very different in some ways to, to Russians or, or Europeans. Um, China is viewed yeah, as being, you know, there are various ethnic stereotypes that I won't repeat. And, you know, there's, 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 there is this persistent myth that, that, that China's aiming to colonize the region and that people are here to, you know, they're, they're being paid to come and marry the women and, and local women and eventually, you know, um, Increase the, the percentage of the population that, that will be Chinese, even though the figures, obviously, of Chinese Chinese uh, workers or expats, migrants living in Central Asia, are very small. So I think you know this has been there for a long time. I don't think it's you know connected very specifically to more more global dynamics. Although we did see, for example, ethnic between rather ironically, Dungans, uh, ethnic or, or way, way Muslims from from China, as they're called in in, in Central Asia, Dungans 
and Kazakhs in southern Kazakhstan right before well, at the beginning of the pandemic in February 2020. And that was in some ways linked to the idea that the Dungans were bringing the virus from China. Um, and there was a sort of anti-Chinese uh, bent to that ethnic violence that led to around 10 people being killed. So I think there's certainly, you know, this is, this is something that differs Chinese population in Central Asia from, differentiates them from uh, other uh, in, investors from other countries, even including you know, Japan and Korea that are quite active um, in infrastructure and, and other investments in Central Asia. They're not viewed in, in such negative terms. So something specific about Chinese. Thank you. Uh, so for, for Zoe to circle back to some of, uh, we got a number of comments and I'm interested to, for you to dive a little bit more into uh, the RMB internationalization aspects of uh, some of the, the themes you touched on. So questions mainly around whether you think, um, you noted a shift in how China is thinking about its um, its economic strategy in Central Asia and with BRI. Um, so we have got some questions about whether um, RMB internationalization, which has been debated for some time now, uh, and questions around China being reluctant to liberalize its currency, whether this is shifting at a global level or just at a regional level in Central Asia. Are we seeing uh, the use of local currencies and specifically the RMB happening in other regions? And is it part of a broader push for enhanced internationalization of the RMB and the de-dollarization trend that you identified in global finance? Yeah, thank you, Alison, for, for this, this question. And I, I think this is a very important and excellent question to ask, uh, especially at this moment, because um, yeah, uh, after uh, the Remedy joined the SDR, um, there has been a, there has been an international uh, considered as backlash, is, if you will, uh, sort of uh, ob people observed that there, uh, China imposed a capital control, and uh, uh, it seems there is a reverse trend on inter Remedy internationalization or being un-internationalized. And uh, that on top of that, there is also President Xi's um, doubling um, domestic, a, a, a kind of cons relatively conservative domestic approach. So people started to uh, ask this big question, uh, why China has reversed its course of, of uh, reform and, and opening up, and is China sort of starting to close its door again? So, I, you know, actually this, the, the, the question is excellent because indeed this, uh, the, uh, the, the, on the one hand, remedy internationalization is not only a regional issue, but also a global level. So China uh, wanted to, it's not necessarily that China's remedy internationalization reversed after China joined up, joined the SDR, but more, more, more importantly, China sort of, after joined the FDR, China realized actually, uh, um, Chinese companies, Chinese com construction firms, and Chinese uh, financial institutions, as they go abroad, they bring not just the labors. You know, in the er in the early days, you receive a lot of complaints about, oh, China not only export its its project, but also export its labors. But now, it's actually China's capital go around, go go around the globe. So. Um, this is not only a regional issue, but an international level, because China is trying to push renminbi internationalization along the BRI. So, in other words, China does not want to liberalize on international terms pushed by international curve, but rather China wanted to uh, internationalize or op op uh, opening up uh, China China's capital market and the international the uh, internationalized renminbi on its own terms and compared with uh, pushing through, you know, being pushed through uh, by following the case of Japan or, or, or Korea, they're, you know, immediately following the liberalization of the capital market, they had uh, the, the, the experienced uh, financial crisis. China did not. Lessons have been learned. So China wanted to, through BRI, it's relatively more controlled, and China has more control over how internationalization can be done and at what pace that the China, the China or more importantly, the CCP would be more comfortable 
comfortable with. So I would say on one hand, it is a global trend. And then on the other hand, the, we, the observation that we, 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 uh, we, we've seen since President Xi came in uh, uh, ascendance to power, this, uh, whether this is why there is this, you know, reversion uh, and uh, to what extent this means China is going, is closed up. I, I think actually this follows a general pattern in China's reform and open up. And if you remember in the early in the early 80s, when Deng, uh, under Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping first, uh, he himself is not necessarily uh, in favor of liberalism. And he actually wrote a couple of articles talking about the liberalism is bad and is represent you know the 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 uh on um, um, the bad taste of capitalism capitalism and then if you follow that pattern a lot of china's economic mastermind for example chen yun and uh then zhu rongji a lot of these people emphasize the reform and open up in the sense that it has to be within the boundaries that the party or the CCP sees or considers as appropriate. So in this particular context, the construction of international renminbi internationalization on the one hand is backed up by China's uh, rising um, foreign exchange reserves. And uh, there has been, uh, in the early days, China didn't have a lot of uh, foreign exchange reserves, but after China joined WTO, especially after the global financial crisis by 2000, uh, around 2013, China's foreign exchange reserve picked at close to $4 trillion. And at that time, there is actually a very kind of cross-border cross -border consensus among policymakers saying where we should uh, use these foreign exchange reserves for and how we can use this, how we can basically push uh, the foreign exchange reserves to achieve either strategic resources purchased overseas or strengthening Chinese um, financial policy so uh, or, fin uh, or uh, 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 foreign uh, policy interests. So from that perspective, um, a, lo a lot of the trend we are observing today, both is at the international level and it fits in China's reform and open up trajectory. Thanks, Zoe. And I'm actually going to stay with you on one, for one more question because it is pretty specific um, to your topic. Um, we've gotten a few uh, questions that touch on your assessment of the current or future role of Chinese cryptocurrencies and access to the digital yuan for uh, the de-dollarization process, the establishment of an alternative financial system that has, uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, dominance. Um, and so what is your kind of assessment uh, for the future of cryptocurrency in the, the research that you're working on? Yeah, thank you, Alison. And this is another excellent question that is dear to my heart. And uh, uh, so, for, for 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 instance, you know, I've been observing cryptocurrency, and I have friends who work in cryptocurrency space. But uh, from my observation, um, China, the same as Russia and India, at domestic level, the uh, policymakers have. Crown uh, and banned all the transactions of digital currency of uh, cryptocurrency. So, which means they do not allow private develop privately developed digital currency that is outside of the control of or outside of the supervision of the government finance. Uh, you know, the government financial supervision. At the same time, similar to many other countries, you know, including Japan, the U.S. Now, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 central bank and the government have been considering, you know, setting up some pilot project. So, uh, considering China's this kind of uh, different approach to, on the one hand, uh, cracking down and ban all cryptocurrency transactions hosted by private uh, by private platforms, and then on the other hand, launching digital renminbi. So how 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 are we reconcile this? So from from my observation, it looks like. Actually, this fits very nicely in China's state-owned monopoly. So, for example, the entire Chinese financial system is owned by this agency or the domestic the domestic financial system, the most important ones. So, for example, you think about China Development Bank, the CDB, or the major financial institutions such as all the four major uh, commercial banks. All these guys are being held. They have a similar, the same shareholder in chief called Central Huijin, who played a very important role in the entire system process of China's financial reform. So 
by so basically the financial security the issue of financial security has been elevated to the issue to the level of national security after the asian financial crisis so if you look at uh, Zhu Rongji's talk or or the other senior uh, chinese uh, leadership's talk prior to asian financial crisis we think about strengthening financial regulation financial supervision and how to mitigate financial risk but after fin asian financial crisis hit suddenly this becomes a very important issue and people talk about not just how to mitigate the risk, but it is a very important and indispensable aspect of national security. So that's why given this the elevation of national uh, financial security into the into the core aspect of china's national security you know the push for internationalization of renminbi to reduce the dependence on the non on the dollars do, dollar dependent global financial system fits in china's vision and the crackdown on cryptocurrency that is beyond the control of the PBOC or any Chinese financial regulators also fits in this broader trend. I guess, you know, my, my, my final conclusion would be for to address this question, it fits in China's overall open up reform and open up strategy. But remember, the reform and open up has always been the definition of it has always been changing and is undefined. And China and the CCP in particular leave it to itself, to the core leadership to interpret what reform means, what opening up means as China internationalize. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to now pivot away. We've uh, dived quite a bit into some of the financial architecture questions, um, but we've also got a number of questions, again, looking at this critical relationship in the region that uh, all three of you really have touched on, but um, when it comes to China and Russia, uh, you know, of course, uh, Central Asia was part of the Soviet Union. Now, certainly in Russia's backyard and Russia has a special interest in the region. And so we have a few uh, audience members asking for our, our experts to unpack a little bit further how China's increasing economic and political influence in the region uh, makes Russia feel how Russia is responding. And if we compare it to other BRI regions, whether China is exercising a level of restraint or um, changing some of its strategies to uh, factor in China's own relationship with Russia and keep that important strategic relationship between China and Russia, um, you know, on a on an even keel, um, and whether we expect to see any of that shifting, if there are areas of heightened tension more so than others, where we would see more pushback from Moscow um, on how the two kind of manage their relationship in this region. So. Any any three of you can respond to it, but I know um, that probably Ed has some comments on this, so I'll, I'll let him go first. Well, I guess I can take the first part of that question. Well, I think Russia, um, of course, has its relationship with China that it frames in, in very positive, or at least in terms of being a strategic partnership globally, and I think they're united in certain um, desires, you know, certain goals um, that bring them together. They're interested in preventing next spillovers from Afghanistan into the region. They're interested in maintaining uh, the region or keeping the region outside of the US sphere of influence and, and reducing US and Western uh, influence within the region. Um, they're interested in maintaining the status quo within the region in terms of having, they prefer to have authoritarian regimes that are loyal and, or at least have positive relationships with China and Russia, um, as opposed to um, having a regime change towards a, a country that may pivot more towards the West, as we've seen in countries like um, in Georgia and also in Ukraine, for example. So they, they certainly have a negative agenda of, of, of sort of keeping things as they are and, 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 and reducing its influence. In terms of, you know, how does Russia view increasing Chinese economic, political and security influence in the region? I think there's not much it can do um, in terms of preventing China's rise within the region. Um, it comes obviously within its very asymmetrical relationship between the two, as has been pointed out by many, um, many people. And at present, in, certainly in terms of security cooperation, um, Russia and China are not directly competing. You know, Russia's share in the arms market, for example, is 
remained pretty steady, in fact increased slightly over the past decade from around 50 to 52 percent as China's percentage has risen, but it's eaten into other um, countries uh, such as France and Turkey and various others that, 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 that you know, may have taken their market share. Um, at the moment, Russia is in still maintains spaces in three of the countries. Um, it's, it's, it remains in a cooperative position with, with China, but of course, in the longer term, you know, there are certain concerns that I've heard um, from uh, Russian analysts and experts that, you know, the long term, in the longer term, you know, China will pose uh, threats to Russia's position in Central Asia, but it's difficult at this point to tell whether Russia would view that as being a threat, to ele an elevated enough threat to respond um, and how it would respond, or whether Russia would um, just accept, as it has thus far, Russia's, I'm oh, sorry, China's presence in what it views as its sphere of influence, or principal sphere of influence, its near abroad. So at this point, Russia has accepted China's presence in the region and not really pushed back in or ways against it. Yeah, if, if I may compliment from Beijing's perspective, I think this is also how the relationship is seen from from that side of the border um, that um, first of all that uh, Russia cannot compete economically uh, with uh, uh, with China in over Central Asia doesn't have the economic means second of all I think they have a, a great understanding of each other and so I think that Beijing is very much aware of in the the historical and cultural heritage um, and necessity to accommodate to a certain extent uh, Moscow's desires, uh, including by acknowledging um, you know the greater Eurasian partnership and trying to find some sort of coordination between the two agendas, uh, Moscow's and 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 Beijing's itself, which overlap quite well as as Ed just mentioned, because overall you know both capitals want the region not to be democratic, thriving, liberal uh, regimes, but rather to sustain this political stability. And so I think the, the sort of uh, untold deal is by helping the region or Central Asian countries to develop economically, it, Beijing is also basically helping them with sustaining this legitimacy that they, that they need. Um, so that also fits with uh, Moscow's objectives for the region. And as far as the security uh, part is concerned, Ed also uh, mentioned that I, I also don't think that Beijing has a burning desire to set, uh, you know, a military presence in Central Asia that's equal or even overwhelming the Russian, frankly. Uh, and we can talk about maybe decades in the future where this might happen, but in the near future, I don't think that this is what Beijing really wants. Um, so that's why they are also trying to find ways other than military to stabilize the region and and the security cooperations that um, Ed also mentioned earlier um, at the public security level, at the uh, surveillance and and cyber level. I think these are. Beijing's contributions to the stability, the security and stability of, of, of Central Asian countries in ways that are different from Moscow. So rather than friction, I think they're quite com complementary. And uh, I, I think you read um, Adesh's point from a view of, uh, of, of Beijing is, is excellent. And I agree with that, what Nadej said. Um, but at the same time, I also want to sort of compliment Nadej and uh, um, add on the issue of uh, using my, I guess, using my own experience. You know, I've talked a lot about the, the from financial side, you know, the dollarization, China and the Russia are not necessarily competing, but they are actually, you know, they share the interest. But using my own experience, experience, I want to talk about, you know, the political and the emotional affinity between 
uh, China and Russia. You know, if we, we look at look back at, at history, the revol the early revolutionary uh, leaders or, or the, the, the Chinese founding fathers, many of them are edu were educated in the Soviet Union. And I remember my my, my grandpa when uh, he he survived the anti Japanese war. Uh, he survived, you know the, the long march, and he survived the the, the Korean War, and, you know, and and also you know before the founding founding of his PRC, he, he he went through the civil war. So, you know, I remember talk, I grew up with him and I, I remember listening to his stories about, you know, how he and the, 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 he, he, his Russian friends back then, he called them you know, the Soviet friends and how he has like a very deep affinity to them, you know, he respect this. Uh, and, and at the same time, he felt that he is close to them. Uh, but from my perspective, I just feel like it's a little bit, you know, distanced from, from my perspective, I, I, I did not grew up in Russia, I didn't interact with them when I was, when I was growing up. And, uh, and then I guess where I'm going to study now, I, I study, I got my degree in America. And similarly, many people of my generation get my degree, get degrees in America. And, uh, you know, many of my friends went back to China to jo either join the uh, policy making circle or, you know, performing other roles. So from that perspective, I'm just, I feel that, you know, in, in terms of political and emotional uh, affinity, or from the people to people exchange, as Nadej mentioned earlier, I don't necessarily think Russia is winning the mind and heart to Nadej. You know, I don't think Russia is winning the heart and mind of Chinese, at least my generation or the later generation. <laughs> So from that perspective, I think, you know, the, the, the sentiment that uh, Soviet or, or, or Russia as China's big brother and we are the, 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 the little counterpart, I, I think those, those eras are, are long gone. <laughs> I think so. All right, so I wanna pivot again a little bit and talk uh, a little bit further about the themes uh, touched on uh, by a few of our speakers, and we've gotten a few questions. I'll try to group them together here. Um, related to US strategy in the region in particular, uh, in the era we're approaching here where the US is withdrawing from Afghanistan. So um, questions surrounding uh, whether US investment in Central Asia in the past was primarily a strategic play by the United States uh, to uh, put forward some presence in countering China's presence and influence, or primarily an investment in order to uh, support U.S. activities in Afghanistan, and whether as the United States withdraws uh, from Afghanistan, what that is going to mean, the consequences for regional stability, for BRI and for China's involvement in the region as uh, the U.S. presence uh, investments uh, kind of draw down. So there's a few different areas to unpack there, um, but if you all have any thoughts in any of those directions, and I think I am going to start again with Ed on this one. Well, I think, you know, early U.S. investments were mostly focused in the energy sector, particularly in Kazakhstan, and I think they had obviously a commercial aspect to them, obviously the un, relatively untapped resources of the Caspian Basin um, by companies like Chevron and Exxon Mobil and others. Um, that also obviously had a geopolitical element to them of Europe's desire to diverse and, you know, diversify you know, fuels, you know, energy supplies away from reliance on Russia as well as obviously um, you know, forming new, new, new transit routes that would, would cut Russia out of the, the, the export of oil and gas from Central Asia. Subsequently, you know, the U.S. investments in the region are quite negligible, and the U.S. you know can't in any way compete with 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 China, with um, Russia um, in the region in terms of the money it's, it's it's willing to put into the region. You know, the U.S. came out with its new Central Asia strategy. I think it was mentioned by Nadej right before pandemic sort of took took root in February 2020, and I think like one of the final foreign visits of Mike Pompeo before the lockdown was to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. The main innovation within that strategy was um, to support the Central Asian states in their uh, independence and to ensure that they could have foreign policies that were not too dependent on any one external power. And that was an obvious, although it wasn't mentioned, it was an obvious signal towards Russia and China. But I think as, as you've mentioned, as, as the US withdraws from Afghanistan, 
um, its interests in the region are already quite minimal. You know, I don't think it has either the will um, or the capacity to, um, to shape outcomes on the ground and to have influence in the way that Russia and China do, I think. From the Central Asian perspective, that's still very important here, and they're obviously, they have agency in this relationship, but they try and pursue multi-vector foreign policies and have positive relationships with external powers. You know, I think there's an interesting keeping relationship with the United States in play because it's obviously a useful, useful um, foil to um, reduce or, or to gain certain concessions benefits from the relationship with, with Russia and China. So I think there's, there's demand, there's more local demand, I think, for a relationship with the United States than there is supply from the United States. So you're Nadesh. Uh, yeah, I think from um, from Beijing's perspective, um, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan is as problematic as the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. Uh, I think it's it's quite an interesting uh, perception. Um, that's it's both at the same time. You know, when when the U.S. Uh, um, uh, started its operations uh, from Beijing, it was, oh, it's another element of a C-shaped encirclement. Now, you know, it's not just in the, on the maritime borders or periphery, but it, they're also present just in a terrestrial land backyard. Um, so there was a discomfort about that. At the same time, you know, basically let him letting the U.S. do the job of stabilizing uh, Afghanistan was not a bad thing. Um, and now it's like, yes, they're withdrawing. So what is it? What is this going to leave us? Is this going to accelerate, you know, the, the spillover that that Ed was mentioning? So a lot of uh, of questions. Um, I I haven't seen much commentary in the in the Chinese sources space yet. I think there's trying to think about it and maybe um, try to draw conclusions about this. For now, the only thing that appears is this, um, this yes, this discomfort at, at that thought and the possibility that things might get more complicated in, in the short run. At the same time, they also feel like um, the U.S. still has some interest in um, a, a stable Afghanistan so that they will do other things that might also help um, with the with a, a, a peaceful resolution, maybe. Um, and um, and there's also multiple actors in the region that might also intervene. So um, still early to say how how Beijing is going to position itself in the region, as I mentioned earlier. Afghanistan was mentioned during the the foreign ministers' uh, meeting, um, China and and Central Asian foreign ministers' meeting two weeks ago, um, but not very much in detail other than saying you know we need to maybe cooperate and making sure that we include Afghanistan in our in our activities and uh, um, so that's that's something we'll we'll need to continue to look at. Um, I think uh, we'll add on to Nash's point with regard to China's strategic vision uh, in the in, in the region. I think from you know, from from geopolitical or just pure geology pers uh, ge ge geology perspective, just Afghanistan simply just from Afghanistan from Kabul to to uh, Ulumuchi is simply just much closer closer than from Beijing to Ulumuchi. From that perspective, you know Afghanistan indeed shares a much shorter border. Uh, than even the Chinese central government to Muslim Xinjiang area, and uh, and Beijing certainly does have a long concern over instability in Afghanistan. So I think not, uh, in, you know China used to think that you know having U.S. in the region to maintain stability is is very important, and um, some people may even say China can be a free rider and to extrapolate economic op opportunities. But then with, with, with U.S. retreat from the region, to what extent China is going to play a role as a um, peace builder in the region? I think um, China, for, at, at this moment, I didn't see any um, government, government document either. Uh, I mean, I didn't see 
any you know, concrete government positions. But you know, uh, given given the region, the regional job, ge ge this, that's a sort of like you know the, the the geology side. Then from economic side, I think Afghanistan, from Chinese perspective, it offers uh, certainly a lot of new economic opportunities to uh, China through the kind of expansion across Afghanistan uh, territory of a Chinese, Chinese BRI project and probably extend that, you know, uh, be, be, a, be, be a very important hinterland or overland path to not only Pakistan connected with China, Pakistan economic corridor, there is also, you know, Afghanistan is also China's direct uh, overland connection to the Middle East, which is a very important uh, China's uh, import of oil and gas. Uh, uh, through increasing its footprint in Afghanistan, uh, China also get the added on benefit of sort uh, of um, uh, com uh, increasing its own influence compared with another regional player, which is India. Great, thanks. So I think we have time for one more short question, um, and uh, I wanted to to get your thoughts, our participants' thoughts um, on how any possibilities for Chinese interest in territorial expansion or territorial disputes in Central Asia plays out um, within kind of the BRI construct. So, of course, China has territorial disputes and issues in many other parts of its neighborhood and its region in South Asia and East Asia. Um, and this question in particular was asking about um, talk last year um, of the Tajik Pamirs belonging to China um, and how that perhaps uh, intersects with China's relationship with these countries, its ability to achieve its objectives um, in, the, in Central Asia and to, um, to develop BRI projects in the region. So uh, I keep going to Ed first, but I think that you'll probably have uh, some comments here. Yeah, I think Tajik, there, there is a history, Tajikistan and uh, China normalized or delimited, delimited their border in 2011, and about 1% 1.7% of Tajik, Tajikistan's land was ceded to China um, at the time, you know, leading to quite a lot of criticism in the media um, of the government's decision to do that, even though this was a small unpopulated parcel of land, there was ideas that it had certain mineral wealth and it was a deeper you know, economic uh, incentive for China to take that, that piece of land. This article last year, if I'm not mistaken, appeared in a rather peripheral Chinese publication by a professor that claimed that something like 40% of Tajikistan's land, the modern day Pamir region, historically belonged to China. It's got quite a lot of play in the Tajik social media, um, again, picking up anti-Chinese sentiments and ideas that China wanted to colonize the region. It got a lot of play, particularly interestingly in the Indian media. Um, uh, that was another sign of, of colonial aggression by expansionist aggression by China. Um, it was, it angered, or at least the, the popular back, backlash um, led the, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I think, to call the, the ambassador in Dushanbe and the capital Chinese ambassador to a meeting. Um, whether that was because they the government itself was upset or because they saw that this was an issue with, you know, uh, some popular backlash it's to be seen, but certainly, but I think there's a lot of, there's, there's a, a, a lot of rhetoric surrounding this and it certainly gets a lot of attention uh, in Central Asia, but I think the reality is that China, I'll defer to my colleagues on, on this, but that China obviously doesn't realistically have um, ambitions to expand territorially into, into uh, Anything else, Nadej, sorry? No, I think it's uh, what Ed just said is, is, is exactly right. I don't, I don't think that China has uh, any appetite. It has solved its border disputes a long time ago with uh, Central Asia. Um, and um, this was an isolated case of, I don't know, fake scholarship. <laughs> Uh, but but what's interesting is 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 more the as Ed mentioned the reaction that this really stirred uh, locally. Uh, that's that really plays into something that is a raw feeling over over the region. So 
And I think that really uh, Beijing is very much aware of that and doesn't want to play with fire. I don't think this is a good calculation, um, nor an ambition. So. Yeah, I don't have anything to add on to that. And, 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 and I, I, I per, my, I'm personally feeling that uh, indeed China, I, I don't see any uh, Chinese sources expressing uh, interest in exp ter territorial expansion in the Western border. Mm -hmm. Great, so that, that takes us up to time here. I want to extend my extreme thanks to all of our participants today um, for some really great uh, analysis and feedback and inputs on all these different themes. I really, I personally really enjoyed bringing them all together here. Um, I thought it was a great discussion. So on behalf of MBR, thanks to all of you um, and thanks to the Bush School DC for, for partnering on this event. And thanks to our audience for submitting some great questions and for joining us here today. Hope everybody has a great rest of your day.